about Bray Wyatt. I, I mean, it, it it says it all. It says that there was no, there was no hope beyond Bray Wyatt for this white rabbit reveal that's been teased over the last several weeks. And it's not even like it was, it it wasn't even the first notes of the, of a theme song that we've been familiar with. It wasn't the stone cold glass shattering or the rock. If you smell what the rock is cooking, it was, it it was, it was an old song that's been in existence for decades and decades and decades. But a song that, that we heard Bray sing to John Cena all those years ago. And, and, and that we've associated with this, this entity that we've, we've come to, to hold in, in such, high regard i mean to me in an era where the fan base sometimes feels as though we know just about as much as anybody that's actually producing what we're seeing we're all sitting down like children in a classroom waiting for bray to to tell us this story, waiting for Bray to explain to us, where did you go? What have you been doing? Why are you back? What is the white rabbit? And 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 what is this rabbit hole that we're going down? Because I think that's the that's the potentially dangerous thing of, of all of this is that as all of the WWE fans and beyond, because I've got friends that are, are don't watch WWE on a week to week basis that are coming up to me and going like, what's this white rabbit thing? Like I keep it. What's this white rabbit thing I'm hearing about there? There's a, a potential danger to the fact that the, with every identity that, that Bray has ever assumed or, or has assumed Bray, this is the one that everybody seems ready to follow and none of us even know what it is yet. Yeah, that's what's so interesting to me about it, Sam. And I promise, uh, for everybody joining, we're going to talk about Fight Pit. We're going to talk about I Quit. We're going to talk about everything. But obviously, this just shook WWE to its very core. So for, just for a little bit longer. Like, you know, I think a, a natural assumption to make would be uh, White Rabbit reveals himself. We have the answers we've been looking for. But Sam, isn't it fascinating that with this guy and what he's able to do, Already, instantly, upon that reveal, we already have so many more questions. Isn't that really something? And that's always been with Bray, isn't it? That that Bray has just, he has this way of communicating. And sometimes it's verbally, and sometimes like this, it's non-verbally. It's just through, it's through visuals and through this presentation. So much is unsaid with Bray that the, the real messaging to me I feel like is what's not said and what's not said is by definition up to interpretation. You know, I, we, we got the reveal. We got the reveal that we're looking for and all it's done is opened the conversation up even wider. Trust me when I tell you the, the economy of theorizing what on earth is happening with Bray Wyatt has has only grown, which is great because is that that's an economy of the, that that economy is my business. Oh, I can't wait for not Sam on Monday, uh, <laughs> but, but, but uh, it's going to be four hours long. Uh, but uh, we could probably talk about this for four hours. We'll circle back to Bray before we close out here. Uh, Sam, there's a whole extreme rules card to talk about that I thought was an incredible <laughs> show. Yeah. From yeah. Top to- oh, oh, <laughs> I forgot. Like. Like, if we could take a break from talking about one of the most newsworthy things yeah. to have happened in a long time, just right before it, one of the best pay-per-views in recent memory happened. Yeah, I forgot about that. Unquestionably, and a really unique, hard-hitting main event that I think was uh, more than fit the bill. If you had never seen a fight pit pat match before, you instantly got it. Uh, we'll, we'll jump right to the end. Riddle with that Broton off the top of the catwalk onto Seth. I'm not sure how either guy stands up after that. Seth freaking Rollins was able to battle back. He had Riddle, not on the ropes because there aren't any, but on the cage. But Riddle ultimately was able to battle through, lock in that triangle for the win. And I mean, Sam, we've said it many times, but I think we both agree. As personal a rivalry as I can think of in not recent memory, just my memory here in WWE, uh, so much to dissect with this one. What'd you make of it? 
it, it was one of those matches where it's designed to not leave any question. It's de- it's designed even with uh, a, a referee like Daniel Cormier who did add more questions. You know, this is this is a, a legendary fighter, one of the toughest people on the planet. But coming in from the outside, does this change the dynamic? Still, by by design, the fight pit should leave no question as to who the winner is. And no matter no matter what the reason is that you walked in, no matter how personal it got, no matter who said what, the music that's playing at the end of the fight pit is the guy that won the fight, is the toughest guy, is the best man. Tonight, the best man was Matt Riddle. I mean, you had you had two people who would stop at nothing to win two people that, that went in there with just something immense to prove, you know, I mean, just, just this week, the, an interview, I think with Ariel Hawani came out with Seth Rollins, where he was talking about his desire to be seen as the number one guy. And, and there was Matt Riddle was on uh Corey Graves podcast talking about everything that he's been through and, 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 and how much bigger I think this match and everything leading into this match was than maybe any of us realized. I think we got it once we got to the fight pit because the stakes had to be this high to justify the level of combat that we saw between these two warriors. No doubt about it. I really felt the weight of it all once they got in there, once it lowered, uh, especially in, you know, DC definitely added some questions and we kind of razzed them on the bump earlier today, but are you going to be impartial? Cause everybody knows that famous video from WrestleMania 31 when Seth's pulled off the heist of the century. But ultimately for anyone who had any questions about DC, he called it right down the middle. Uh, and I mean, I don't think that can be well, debated. Well, I will say this about DC. There Whoa. was that, there was that, and you know, I'm, you know, I'm big on this officiating. I got real mad on SmackDown. When I'm watching, when I'm watching Gunther tap out, referee's not calling it a tap out. I go, "What is this officiating?" We'll talk about what, that. I, I, there was this moment when when Riddle was down. DC was a little late on starting the count. I, he may have still gotten up. He, I don't know if he was down for a full ten. I'm just saying there was. I want to be fair to DC. There. There. No, he you're was right. A little late on starting the count. I want to be fair to DC there though, and I don't disagree with you. But the rules in MMA are different than the rules in the fight pit. I think DC's instinct as an MMA, MMA competitor, who, you know, if you're in MMA, you're knocked out, you're knocked out. You know, the 10 count is a different element for DC. I think his instinct was to check on Riddle, and then he was like, oh, I have to count here. Uh, and so I would, be, I would be fair to DC in that regard, although I do not disagree with you at the same time. Uh, for Seth, Sam... The RV tr- the tribute was awesome, and you know there was no debating. I think with most people. By the way, by the way, but and that's it. I hate to. I, I don't like interrupting. It's unprofessional, but oh, you're the last professional broadcaster. It's fine. Okay, RVD tribute or RVD troll. I think that's up to interpretation as well. <laughs> that's also fair. Um, I agree with both your points so far. Uh, but uh, um, so no debating that Riddle had the advantage heading into this. People could argue how much of an advantage. I would have argued a big one, and I'll circle back to that in a second. Not just because of his fight pit experience, but because of his MMA experience. Riddle was a damn good MMA fighter. Really, really freaking good, no pun. With that said, though, I thought Seth closed the gap early in this and really came out strong and looked like he had it at several points near the closing moments. Uh, we're not, we, uh, you don't believe in moral victories and I don't really either. What does Seth take away from this, Sam? Is there anything other than disappointment? No, I mean, look, Seth takes away a loss, you know, bottom line. Seth, Seth I think anybody besides Matt Riddle would have lost to Seth Rollins tonight because Seth Rollins, I mean, he, he's a superhero when he's inside that squared circle. But ultimately, on this night, in that moment, that's got to be the takeaway. Taking anything away from this besides this, besides a loss is living in denial. You can't live in denial. Yeah, you know, the fact that he got up, the fact that he got up and still had had Riddle being being slammed into the uh, into the sides of the fight pit after Riddle leapt from those platforms, an amazing feat. Seth Rollins did incredible things 
both mentally uh, and, and physically. Incredible things. But ultimately, Seth needs to just keep getting better. And I think in life, when you lose, the way you stop that from happening again is to accept the fact that you lost and figure out how to not lose next time. No, for sure. Uh, agreed completely. You talked about physical and mental advantages. That's a perfect unintentional segue to the I Quit match. And Sam, I will tell you up front, this may be the longest recap I ever do on one of these, so just bear with me. Uh, because coming, there was a lot that happened. Coming into this match tonight, I, I don't think either of us could have seen a scenario where Edge would say I quit to Finn or literally anyone, but Finn and the Judgment Day found the one and only way, I think. An incredible match. It spanned throughout the entire arena. I think both guys went into overdrive to try and abuse the other. I think, honestly, both succeeded. Edge battled back from being just absolutely decimated by the Prince. But just as Edge took control, here came the Judgment Day. They made their way down. Uh, Edge found himself handcuffed thanks to Rhea Ripley, who is just the ultimate game changer in WWE right now. Uh, that led to him being just destroyed by Finn, Damian, and Dominic. Ray then came out to try and even the odds, but then Dominic blindsided Ray. Beth then came out, Beth Phoenix, Edge's wife. She actually did even the odds. Her and Rhea Ripley went at it like it was real life Dragon Ball Z. It was awesome. Uh, but then Brass Knucks from Rhea Ripley, again, the game changer, ever the game changer, knocked out Beth. Finn then just absolutely brutalized Edge with coup de gras after coup de gras, and Edge still would not quit. It was not Sam until Rhea had Beth, who was motionless, for a concerto where Edge begrudgingly but also instantly because he cares about his wife more than anyone obviously in the planet uh said i quit just to get the judgment day to stop except rhea ripley did not stop uh and beth late was laid out with the concerto leaving edge shocked and enraged and you know in defeat uh sam before anything else we just want to send our best wishes to beth and we hope she's okay hopefully we get an update because of that, Sam, I usually ask you like a very layered type of question with a lot of terminology and verbiage. I'm not going to do that here. Um, this was captivating, but it was also heartbreaking. And I want your thoughts. It's like, I mean, it's if you can separate yourself from the human emotion of it, if you can separate yourself from the individuals involved here, it was like watching a movie. It was like being yeah. on an emotional roller coaster, the ups and downs and and watching Watching Finn Balor find this new version, level up yet again, coming out to the ring looking like Yeezus era Kanye West with that mask <laughs> and, and realizing that there was symbolism behind that mask and, and, and realizing that this is the evolved version of the prince that we saw come to life during his last uh, 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 stint in NXT when he was the NXT champion of the world watching Finn Balor hold the advantage, Edge take over, Finn, Edge, and, and, and feeling all these moments where you just spear repeated, spear repeated, spear repeated. I can't believe it. Edge has this. No, he doesn't. Turn it around. Coup de grace, coup de grace, coup de grace. Here comes Beth. All this stuff happening. And for someone like me that's been watching every hour of content that the WWE produces for well over three decades now. The fact that I can still get taken on those rides is, is what I appreciate the most about shows like this. Now, when you're talking about the individuals involved, right, that's looking at it through a macro lens, looking at the forest, not paying attention to the trees. I'm not connected. Let's talk about the people involved, okay? Because you don't want to see families go through this. You don't want to see a man. I'm a married man. I got a family. You don't want to see a, a, a man have to look at this treatment of his wife. You don't want to have to see anyone who's given us as much as Edge has given us go through what Edge went through or anyone who has given us as much as what Beth Phoenix has given us go through what Beth Phoenix went through. But ultimately, I found myself looking at that going, well, what did they think was going to happen? You know, I was, uh, I, I looked it up because I said, this has to be one of, if not the most deadly sin. And it is, it's considered the deadliest of the seven deadly sins wow. is pride. Pride is the worst sin that you can, you, you can to have pride in your heart 
is as bad as it gets. To me, Edge was blinded by his own pride. Edge somehow, even though this is an I quit match, forgot that he's dealing with a, with a, with a lawless group that he created. If anybody understands the the lack of moral character that the Judgment Day has, and they're they're singularly minded, uh, goal oriented focus, it should be Edge. This is an environment that number one, I would realize the odds are stacked against me because of the numbers disadvantage. But number two, I'm keeping my family far away from the judgment day because as I'm sitting there watching this happen to Beth and I didn't want to see it happen to Beth. I felt terrible for everybody involved. Of course. Who invited Beth in the ring? Well, I, I think she went in on her own accord, Sam. Edge said, get me Oh, the at chair. the very end, get me the chair. Yes. I mean, the initial impulse. To, how, was her, did she, you know. how did she end up in the position that she was in? She, where was she? Where <laughs> Sam, I don't know if I like where this is going. Uh, she, was, she was she was in the ring because Edge asked her to come in the ring. Why? Why? Because pride, I think, got in the way. Ego got in the way. This this vision of ah, now we're gonna we're gonna beat him. We're gonna beat him now. We got him now. I just you know kicked Dominic in the nether regions. Now we've got him, and it's like no, you don't. You never. Never have the Judgment Day. I just watched. This is how strong the Judgment Day is, okay? I've watched Dominic stand by his father loyally. I've seen it for the last couple of years in the WWE ring. I can only imagine th throughout his entire life he was there with him. And somehow, over the course of only a couple of months, the Judgment Day has infected Dominic's brain to the point that Dominic is laying a beating on his own father, Rey Mysterio, okay? If the Judgment Day is that lawless and that powerful, I don't care how sure you are of your victory. You don't bring your wife into that ring, even if your wife is a Glamazon. I see where you're going. I don't know if I fully... I, ultimately, I think rage, maybe even more than pride, but that might be semantics. Uh, to your point, though, I mean, you know, there's, so, I mean, there was literally so many moving parts, literally so many moving parts in this one. Dominic paid huge dividends for Finn. You know, Ray could have even these odds, and then maybe Beth is never even out there. Alas, it happened the way that it happened. To fast forward, potentially, and again, I get we send Beth our best wishes, and we hope she's okay. It was really a troubling scene. But if we can fast forward, and I don't know if we can, but let's just hypothetically in a vacuum do it. You know, Judgment Day wins the night, but Sam, in the long run, does doing this to Edge, doing this to Beth, does this hurt their chances of winning the fight overall? Because everything you say, said about Edge, how in 2006 this would have been his move, and maybe it's not his move now. However, I think you get him much closer to this being his move when you do something like this. Do you agree? I mean, yeah, they might be able to bring out the worst in Edge, sure. But what's that going to do? The Judgment Day is still the Judgment Day. They, we're not talking about one person that, up, oh, he's going to bring out the worst in Edge. The worst, look, Edge is a Hall of Famer. He's a multi-time world champion. He's one of the greatest to ever do it without hyperbole. But you're talking about Finn Balor and Damian Priest and Dominic Mysterio, and Rhea Ripley. You're talking about four lawless individuals that are working as a singular unit. The Edge is going to have to do a lot more than dig deep. Edge is going to need to find numbers. Edge is going to need to find backup. Because so far, the team of Edge and Ray has not been enough to stop this force. And the reality is, is that, you know, Ray has been a great ally to Edge, but he's you know, not willing to put hands on one of, you know, Finn's cohorts, which makes the whole thing impossibly all the more difficult. Uh, again, all the best to Beth. But when talking about numbers, advantages, uh, Bianca Belair cared not for those things tonight. Uh, <laughs> Bailey had the prophecy laid out since she returned at SummerSlam. Uh, she fell short tonight. Bianca and her put on a classic, a history-making ladder match. 
wasn't fully one-on-one for Bianca, though. She had to deal with damage control. I think predictably, I think we all figured that could happen. And Bianca did deal with damage control, dropping them with an unreal double KOD. From there, both B- Bailey and Bianca, excuse me, did plenty of innovating with the ladder, but it was Bianca who topped her own KOD from earlier and one of the more incredible ladder moments I've seen in a very long time, really defying physics by dropping Bailey and the ladder simultaneously <laughs> with the KOD so that she could then ascend the ladder, grab the title, retain her title. Sam, a lot of people, a lot of people were picking against Bianca coming into tonight and she proved them wrong by basically defeating three people and again we just talked about how numbers advantages are everything it's almost silly to say this at this point Sam because she has been on the roll of roles since Wrestlemania but how much does this win this one in particular do for Bianca I mean, I don't know, man. I stopped picking against Bianca like four years ago, so I don't know. (laughs) It's it's odd to me that anybody still would. You know, this is one of those things like I'm sitting there looking at Bianca Belair on top of the ladder going, yeah, I mean, there's no. it's not a matter of opinion anymore. This is a person on the short list of the greatest athletes to ever hold that title. There's not very many people, even arguably, above her, if any, at this point. Um, I think you hit the nail on the head when you talked about being prepared for the fact that it wasn't going to be one-on-one. And that's what you're talking about in the last match, you know? Sometimes you have to realize, hey, there's, there's, there's more than just my opponent, and I know this because I've studied up, because I know what to expect. I think Bianca walked into Extreme Rules realizing, look, disqualifications are going to be thrown out the window. This is a ladder match. There's no way. There is no way that this match stays one-on-one. I think Bianca knew that. I, I, I think that she was not shocked when the rest of Damage Control came out and made their presence felt. And that's why she was able to control the situation. She was able to control the damage, as it were. My, that pun was intended. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I think it's, it's amazing to me, because I like, I, I like to look at Twitter. I like to look at all the reactions. Oh, you're a fan of Twitter? I love Twitter. It's a social Me media too. network. You guys yeah. should check it out. We're on it right now, actually. Oh, wow. I had no idea. <laughs> yeah, that's um, cool. It's fun. But I, I think that it's amazing to me that there are still people who are wowed by Bianca's athleticism and her physical strength. And I think that it's, it's, it's a credit to how good Bianca is. That, she st- that even though this is like, yeah, we reported on this years ago this was this was the the she called herself the est in nxt we we all knew how strong she was we knew how fast she was we knew how athletic she was and yet still still she's able to do things that even make someone like you ryan come in here and say (coughs) can you believe what we saw well real quick (laughs) sorry yeah yeah. it's 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 an incredible feat that she's still able to do that. And I think it, it, it tells you a lot about what a talent Bianca Belair is. Absolutely. And I, I apologize for almost interrupting. I just want to say, I, I am never surprised. I'm just always in awe. I guess on some level I'm surprised, but just, you know, cause I think sometimes Sam, you're right. That people can take this for granted. We'll talk about damage growing in a second, but ladders, Sam, I don't know if you ever done like yard work. They're nope. hard to, never. they're hard to nope. hold. I've yeah. never, I've never done new yard work. Uh-uh. <laughs> no, no. Their ladders in and of themselves are hard to pick up. They're hard to navigate. They're heavy. This is uh, these things are understandable. But you see these ladder matches, and you, I think you take it all for granted. People definitely take Bianca is an unreal athlete, not by WWE standards, not by by human standards. She's one of the greatest athletes I have ever seen in my life. Doing a KOD to a ladder. Would not be easy. It would be difficult. Doing a KOD to Bailey in a ladder is absolutely unreal. Would not be believable in a video game stuff. It's incredible. And I just hope people don't take it for granted. And they actually really think about it sometimes because it's insane. It's truly insane. She's insane. Wow, what an athlete. I say it literally every single time. To the damage control side of things, though, Sam, they're still the WWE Women's Tag Team Champions, Dakota and EO. How much does this defeat set damage control back? Not even necessarily Bailey, but damage control back in your opinion. I, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't think it, I don't think it does. 
damage control is still damage control is still damage control. Like you said, they're still holding on to the WWE Women's Tag Team Championship. You know, the idea that because Bailey lost one match, she's not one of the goats as far as all this is concerned is absurd. There, there, you, you, what are you going to sit there and go like, wow, Bailey lost that one time. She's never going to be world champion again. I, of course, that's a that's a ridiculous thing to say. I think Bailey dusts off. I think Damage Control dusts off. I think they go. Here's something Damage Control is really, really good at: strategizing, coming up with plans, figuring out. Okay, that didn't work. What will work? And I think that's what Damage Control does now, so that the next time Bailey gets an opportunity, because there will be a next time. And that when that happens and Bailey gets that next opportunity at the Raw Women's Championship, she's ready to take it home. I agree with you. I agree with you. Uh, next time was this time for Ronda Rousey, who promised no controversy this time. And uh, Ronda Rousey came out the gate strong in this Extreme Rules match, looking like she was honestly, Sam, going to get control and keep control until whenever she damn well pleased. And in some ways, that's kind of what happened. Liv found moments of offense thanks to such objects as fire extinguishers and baseball bats. Uh, but Ronda always found herself taking back control sooner than later, even after taking uh, quick but big doses of punishment. Uh, Liv would get control back. She pelted Ronda a good dozen times with a steel chair. And Ronda was staggered. Uh, then cannonballed her through a table. But Ronda, incredibly, uh, talk about athletes, not only kicked out, but then transitioned into a submission that made Liv pass out. But Sam, not before Liv seemingly smiled, maybe at the fact that Ronda couldn't tap her out. Maybe I'm totally off the mark on that. Who knows? However, Sam, the lead here is that Ronda Rousey is yet again SmackDown Women's Champion. And to me, it feels like Ronda is maybe the most dangerous she has been since she literally changed the face of women's sports and the world all those years ago, how do you see it? Uh, yeah, I, I felt like uh, Ronda was clutching onto that SmackDown Women's Championship like a Thor glove and just saying, this is inevitable. <clears throat> you understand, this is inevitable. Because that's exactly how I felt. You might as well put Ronda's face on that title. Because, yeah, it might you might slip it off her for a couple of months here and there, but inevitably... Ronda Rousey is the person that's going to win that title back. Uh, I think Liv was impressive. Liv showed a, a, a lot of great things. She showed a lot of grit. Uh, I think uh, Liv took a lot more punishment than any of us, even a couple of months ago, would have ever thought she was capable of taking. And she survived in there a lot. I was very impressed by Liv Morgan. But at the same time, I wondered if she was out of her depth. You know, I wondered if, if look, Liv Morgan is outmatched. And I think she was outmatched tonight. And I think Ronda showed up and said, no more games. It's time for me to take what's mine back. And she did. Um, as far as Liv smiling, okay, uh, I could, if she's smiling because Ronda couldn't tap her out, it's like, look, you're still not, I don't think that that's why she was smiling. I, I have no idea. Imagine right. that when your arm is on the verge of breaking or whatever, or whatever hold she was in, maybe her neck was, she's on, she's losing consciousness. <laughs> when you're on the verge <laughs> of losing consciousness for whatever reason, I don't think that you're thinking to yourself, ha ha, but at least I didn't fall asleep. You know, I, 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 I don't, I don't, I don't think that could have been it. Honestly, I sat there wondering if Ronda Rousey had downright smacked Liv Morgan silly because Liv smiling. And I saw Megan Morant had a digital exclusive with Liv Morgan and, 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 and she was in a, a, a dark corner of the arena trying to, this feels like a different Liv Morgan coming out of this match, but I would imagine that it would be. And at this moment, without talking to Liv, I would credit Ronda Rousey for potentially smacking her silly. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, Ronda was once described as a once in human history athlete. And I think once in human history athletes can do such things to, uh, you're right, a really, really gritty and game live Morgan tonight. But again, you and I are not in the business of moral victories, but it was impressive. Sam, a lot of questions, as you said, about live coming out of this, none of which that we have any answers to right now, which is kind of the theme of the night. Um, 
let's just say Liv called you in a couple hours and said, Sam Roberts, I need counsel from you. How would you advise Liv to rebound from this? What would what would you say to her as she now has to reset here, not any longer SmackDown Women's Champion? I go, Liv, first of all, you got to stop smiling when people have you in <laughs> that is not a pleasant thing to happen. It's not good news. It's bad news. And second of all, let's get some W's. I've said it before to you. Let's forget about Ronda. Don't worry about that title right now. Let's go out there and let's get some W's. And as far as winning back the women's championship, you're probably going to have to wait until Ronda Rousey decides she's finished with it because I don't see that happening. But in the meantime, that doesn't mean we can't collect some W's. Let's go out there and find some people we can get some W's from, and we'll move on from there. Let's get the confidence up. Sam picking W's like we pick apples in the fall. I love it. Uh, but yeah, I don't know how anybody beats this version of Ronda Rousey. Not saying it can't be done. I just don't know how you do it because I think it's about as impossible a task as a human being can have in 2022. Uh, I also don't know how you beat Karrion Cross when Scarlett is running literal interference. Drew McIntyre wanted a strap match with Cross because he wanted to keep him right in front of him. And Karrion tried to start things out without tying himself to the strap. Drew finally got him where he wanted, literally where he wanted him, but it was still an uphill climb. Drew took the fight to Cross, but with Scarlett there, again, making huge, huge impacts. Cross was able to target Drew's shoulder that he had already done a number on last night on SmackDown. Uh, yeah, still technically last night. It's 11.58 here on the East Coast. Uh, uh, Cross was able to leverage all of that into long stretches of dominance. Drew battled back like he always does until Scarlett struck Drew in the face with literally damn near a whole bottle of law enforcement grade pepper spray, allowing Cross to hit the cross hammer for the then academic win. Drew couldn't see. He could barely move. Uh, Sam, what does this win do for Cross? And can Scarlett's value even possibly be quantified? Well, I wasn't. I mean, I know Corey Graves said it was pepper spray. He said he got the can. I thought it might have been bear spray. It looked strong. It looked real strong, and, and, I mean, Drew went down like a sack of potatoes. But, you know, I was I was disappointed in Drew McIntyre. I'll be 100% honest with you. You know, this wow. was one of those scenarios. I feel like Drew is one of, if not the best WWE superstars on the roster. Drew is one of those guys who has only upside, and there's a reason why he's the chosen one. And there's a reason, you know, you heard Karrion Cross let us know exactly how he felt, the way he dictated a lot of what was going through his head during the match and bringing up the fact that Drew had been labeled the chosen one while the, while Karrion clearly had not. And bringing up all these things that really got under Karrion Cross's skin. Karrion Cross got into the world of Drew McIntyre, predicted the way he would behave so that Cross could take advantage of it. That's not something that McIntyre did. The fact that McIntyre underestimated Scarlett, I think is a, is a colossal mistake. It, I, you know, I don't, I don't think that it's a coincidence that all this happened. It happened at the beginning of the match and the end of the match. Drew McIntyre made one mistake and he made it multiple times and that's underestimating Scarlett. Scarlett got in the ring and Drew walked away from her like she was just playing a game, like she was nothing. You don't think that lady has tricks up her sleeve? I mean, she didn't have sleeves on, I don't think. But <laughs> metaphorically speaking, we got you don't it. think she's hiding tricks somewhere? Of course she's hiding tricks. That's what she does. She's, 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 she's as, as, as much of a beast as Karrion Cross is physically, Scarlet will attack you on a mental level like no one else will. And the fact that I watched Drew McIntyre ignore that, it was disappointing to me. I think that I think that what Karrion Cross did tonight was he put the entire WWE on notice. That 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 as a great man once said, he's coming for that number one spot. That there's only one reason. There's only one reason that Karrion Cross is back in WWE. And it's to do what he did in NXT, quite frankly, and dominate the entire roster. And I think that uh, taking care of Drew McIntyre tonight is a real good first step in letting people know you're there to destroy everyone.
It's interesting on both of those points, Sam, because we had Karrion and Scarlett on the bump earlier today, and Scarlett literally said that she has tricks up her sleeves at all times. She was actually oh. wearing she was wearing sleeves at that point. Um, but Karrion, I mean, he made it clear. That, I mean, obviously Drew McIntyre was his focus tonight, but you go back to him being front row at Clash at the Castle. You go back to his first night back. Uh, the undisputed WWE Universal Championship is also top of mind for him. I wonder if for Drew. Ultimately, he had, you know, he had his convictions as to why he thought a strap match would be the right call. He wanted to make sure literally Carrion could not get out of his sights, go anywhere. But I almost wonder if it created a distraction for him where he couldn't focus as much on Scarlet as maybe he should have because of literally being tied to Cross. Uh, if it had been a different stipulation, who knows what happens? We'll never know. A huge win for Carrion. Uh, the Brawling Brutes, they like a good old-fashioned Donnybrook match, Sam, let me tell you. And so do we. Um, about as high-octane a six-man six tag match as you'll ever see. Uh, the Brutes and Imperium went nonstop, legitimately nonstop from bell to bell. It got pretty violent. Uh, shillelaghs, barricades, literal bar stands, uh, all of those were used. It was still maybe Gunther's chops that made the biggest impact. It was a furious closing sequence. Butch moonsaulted off of barrels. It was awesome. The Brutes nonstop assaulted Imperium with more shillelaghs, many shillelaghs. And then Sheamus hit a Celtic cross onto Gunther through a table, taking Gunther out of the equation, and then connected with a bro kick to Vinci for the win. Just a legitimately insane match. What a way to kick off the show. Uh, Sam, Gunther took to using weapons yet again. He did on SmackDown, except this time it was unsuccessful for him and Imperium in the win column. We'll talk about last night's title match because I know you have thoughts in a second. But first, what was your biggest takeaway from what we saw tonight? It just, I mean, it's gorgeous. Just beautiful. Just beautiful, beautiful action. As a fan watching that, it's exactly what I want to see. It's just, it's its incredible. It's the stuff I want to tell my children about. It's beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful, gorgeous stuff. The, the, the brawling brutes and the way they come out and just so clearly enjoy the art of fighting. They, it's not just a thing that flashes on the screen. It's not just a catchphrase for a t-shirt. The brawling brutes love to fight people. And you can see that in everything they do. The, 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 the respect that Imperium has for the mat. And not only, not only the respect that they have for the art form of wrestling, but the, the, the joy they take in ensuring that that respect is met by their opponents. is just a wonderful thing. What makes these two forces coming together so special is that there's something about Imperium and the Brawling Brutes that whenever it happens, they fight like there's no tomorrow. There is nothing left in the tank. Nothing matters after this fight. The winner is the winner because they gave absolutely everything and they're going to figure out what's left of their physical being after this fight's done all six of these superstars have that trait in common and when and and that to me is why you see these explosions happen when these two forces meet in the ring it's just such a a pleasure as a fan to get to watch it really is. It's that intangible quality. Uh, you know, I think about, you know, New Day and Usos and so many other examples that it doesn't matter how many times you see it. It's magic every time. It's different every time. And it builds on itself every time. For me and you as fans, we both use our words. And, you know, you just said that all beautifully. But it's really just awesome. Like, it's just really awesome to see. It makes me feel good as someone who covers this stuff. Uh, they don't feel good after the fact, but we do. Um, all right, Sam, I, I got to use my words carefully here. You know, I'm sure maybe we'll talk about the, the uh, Friday night. We all saw it. I think you and I may see this a little bit differently, but I will cede the floor to you. Was Seamus robbed or was it the right call by the official on SmackDown? With this, what are you talking about specifically with the, the submission or with the final call? The tap out, the tap out specifically. Or they're not tap no, as it may the, be. The, the, I think I uh, regardless of I do I think that Gunther intended to tap. No, I do not think in that moment he was necessarily submitting, but I do think that he tapped. 
And and it has not been made clear to me how that could possibly not be a tap. I was fine with everything else. I was fine with, with Gunther. And here's why, why Gunther is so smart. He realized this official is missing stuff tonight. I'm going to take advantage of that. Gunther saw in the moment, whoa, I just tapped and I get to keep competing? <laughs> Not too shabby, huh? What a deal. <laughs> and so that's why he went out and he used the shillelagh, I think, because he realized this is a very distractible official tonight. Maybe this, maybe she was just having a bad night. I don't know. I'm not there to rate the, her, her entire job evaluation. I'm just talking about this one moment in this one match. I believe Gunther saw a weakness. He saw, and, and you know Gunther. You know he's a pro at this. You know he's going to take advantage of any weakness that he can use in his favor. I think he saw a weakness in the official. And I thought ultimately that's what cost Sheamus the match. Not even necessarily the the tap out wasn't called, but once that tap out wasn't called, Gunther was able to take advantage. Absolutely. Sam versus the officials may be the rivalry of 2022, but we'll see how the year end awards shake out. I mean, he's got all I ask, all I ask, this is it. (laughs) Go ahead. You say, hey, Sam, let's get on spaces and we talk about the pay per view. Yep. I'm not coming on here and talking about WrestleMania. I'm talking about extreme rules because that's the job. (laughs) That's the job. If I came to you and said, let's talk about Cody Rhodes versus Seth Rollins, you'd go, Sam, you're doing a bad job. Okay, that's bad. You're doing a bad job. Nobody's tuning in to hear you talk about a pay-per-view from before. Let's talk about tonight's premium live event, right? Sure. So when I see, and, 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 and if a referee saw me do that, they should say, Sam's no good at this. <laughs> but that's not happening. So when I'm watching and I go, okay, this is not good. It's not a personal thing. I'm just, I see it. This is, it didn't, it wasn't good. But let's uh, just, just you run into Jess Carr in a back alley. Who knows what would happen? But uh, I, I'd probably be bad for me. Probably <laughs> bad for me. That's not what this is about. Probably bad. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's reset. We will begin to close this out, but we would be remiss if we did not finish where we started. But now, you know, we've probably been on here for 40, 45 minutes or so. Uh, as we've, you know, as you subconsciously have digested what we saw at the end of the show, any final thoughts on this premium live event in general or specifically the return of Bray Wyatt? I, I mean, I had already before, you know, when that uh, copyright logo flashed on, leave it, leave it to the WWE, huh? To flash that copyright logo and then, oh, one more thing. I don't know where <laughs> I've seen that before, but when that copyright logo flashed and it was the end of the pay-per-view, I'm sorry, the premium live event after the, uh, uh, after, after the fight pit match, I said, that was an incredible show. I loved that PLE. What a night. And then the lights go out and I went, Oh boy, I forgot about the thing that I was anticipating the most. So for that to be, I mean, that's a hell of a cherry to put on top really of is. amazing cake, you know? Um, but yeah, I I I I I I I think that 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 a great premium live event should leave you feeling satisfied, like there was resolution. Should leave you feeling satisfied on the level of man, I was really I had a I had a great time. I was really entertained watching that show. What a great show that was, and should leave you hungry for what's to come next. And I got to tune in on Monday because I got to find out what's happening next. And there were certainly those moments, right, in the matches where it's like I I felt satisfied. I felt good. I felt like what's going to happen next for this superstar? What's going to happen next for this rivalry? But I think the question on everybody's mind leaving this show is what is Bray doing back in WWE. And I think that when you get to the season premiere of Monday Night Raw and the DX reunion and the Barclays Center and Lashley versus Rollins and everything else that's happening, the Bray Wyatt question is the one that's going to be on the mind of of all of us that tune in to what will no doubt be an incredible Monday Night Raw.
I couldn't agree more. And what's so cool about it is that it was an incredible moment tonight. It was really a show of incredible moments, but Bray specifically, what's really exciting for all of us is that that's just the first now of many, many moments and many more questions, many more answers, and then many more questions after those answers. A lot to look forward to. For all the fallout from Extreme Rules, tune into the season premiere, as Sam mentioned, of Raw this Monday, 8-7 Central on USA Network. And then to hear a full breakdown of all of that and the New Day's WMAC Masters gear from SmackDown. Check out Kayla, <laughs> check out Kayla, Matt, and myself talk it all out this Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern on WWE's The Bump on Peacock and all of WWE's social channels. And if you want just a little more Extreme Rules in your life, Go check out Ultimate Extreme Rules on Peacock and YouTube, YouTube right now, excuse me, with me, Sam, Camp, Kaz, and Ultimate Commissioner Johnny Gargano, where I think Sam, you'll agree. It was, we've done a lot of absurd things on that show, but this was by far the most absurd in the two-year history. Would you agree? I would say it was by far the most absurd, and I would say this one, if you're going to watch the Ultimate Show, Ultimate Extreme Rules, it's a very, very fun uh, fantasy show that we all do together. Watch it until the end, because the the stipulations that these guys <laughs> put me through, especially that Gargano, the, the stipulations that I am put through as we try to put together an amazing show are, are, are just, uh, I was tested. I was put to the test. I'll say that. You pass with flying colors. Uh, Sam, Drew, truly one of the great joys of every month is doing this with you. I appreciate you. Thanks to everyone for listening. Uh, Bray Wyatt is back. Extreme Rules was a classic. Have a great night, everybody.